Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. We have apologies for this section of the meeting from Annie Wells, MSP, and Oliver Mundell, MSP. This is the eighth meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can I remind everyone to switch their mobile phones um, off and put them away? And can I welcome um, Professor Robert Larzulaire, Human Development and Family Science, Oklahoma State University. You're very welcome this afternoon, Professor. Can I invite you to make an opening statement of up to three minutes, please? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for letting me appear before your committee about this important bill. I share your primary concern, which is the welfare of the children of Scotland. That's the reason I devoted my career to parenting research. I thought children needed the best of research, not the the best research should not be for putting people on the moon, but for helping children achieve their full potential. I've asked three, two primary questions that you need to know the answer to. One, what should we tell parents to use instead of smacking when we tell them not to smack their children? Secondly, it's clear that smacking is correlated with antisocial aggression and other kind of adverse looking outcomes. Is that, correlation, is that correlation because smacking is causing more problems, or is it because children that are more oppositional force parents to use more of all discipline tactics? I've been recognized as one of the leading experts on smacking and alternatives to it since at least 1996, when I was one of seven invited speakers to the only scientific consensus conference on the outcomes of corporal punishment, co-sponsored by the American Academy of Pediatrics and published in their journal, Pediatrics, in that year of 1996. In 1998, there was a court case trying to ban smacking in Canada. As a response, the court system in Canada considered evidence on both sides, from social sciences and from legal aspects more thoroughly than any country has ever done before or since. So they came out with a middle of the road position that was very much like the current law in Scotland, that, uh, but also restricted reasonable smacking to between the ages of two and 12 inclusive. Consequently, since then, the trends in child abuse has decreased 40% in Canada, whereas it increased by sixfold the next 15 years in Sweden when they had the most rigorously enforced smacking ban in the world. So I recommend that you look to Canada as the example to follow rather than Sweden. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, Professor. I'm going to ask individual members of the committee to introduce themselves before they ask their questions in case there's difficulty seeing the name, please. I'll go on. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Lars uh, My name is Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm a Liberal Democrat MSP. I'm uh, vice convener of the committee. Can I start by asking, is it okay for me to launch into questions yes. or do you want everyone to introduce? Yes. Okay. Um, Professor, um, can I start by asking, would you define yourself as an academic? Yes, I've been a researcher, yes. Okay. And would you also agree um, that the sort of academic standard worldwide uh, for, in any discipline would be to present a hypothesis and then to t test that hypothesis using empirical uh, research or evidence that either proves or disproves that hypothesis? That's correct. And you want to try to do it as objectively as possible. Great. Um, I ask that because um, you present a hypothesis in your submissions to this committee, which I think is probably the most striking argument against a smacking ban that I have ever read, and that is um, using the evidence of the Swedish example, um, you reference the fact that between uh, 1979 and 2010, when um, the, the ban was brought in in 79, that the, Sweden has witnessed a 7,000% increase in the number of juvenile rapes in that country, or rapes by young people in that country. And I quote, um, although increased willingness to report rapes may have accounted for part of these increases, some of this 73-fold increase is likely because a small but increasing number of boys never learn to accept no from their mothers. 
it strikes me that the word likely is not very scientific, and this is a, arguably the strongest argument we've heard against it. So what empirical evidence do you have to, to evidence the causality of the smacking ban and the increase of rapes in New Zealand? Yet the same interpretation problem as, uh, as global warming. Global warming is up, the temperature of planet Earth is about up 7%. As you correctly said, this is an increase of 7,000%. But for global warming, the more the causal question is, are human activities causing that increase? And there are debates about that. That's not quite as clear. So, um, so the, the increase of these kind of, now these are alleged uh, these are not substantiated. I don't have records of that, but these are alleged allegations of of rapes of children under the age of 15. P Professor, yes? forgive me, it's uh, Ruth McGuire, the convener. You said that these are alleged and there is no record of them. Are, are you saying that the, the, the evidence you've presented is not based on recorded crime or recorded accusations of crime? Can you just be clear about that, please? Yes, thank you. These are criminal records in Sweden. And, uh, and they report in those records, these are allegations. So it's serious enough to have an allegation, and the allegations of rapes in 1981 were 73 times as often allegations of rapes of, the, of children under the age of 15 in 2010. And, and some people say that that's because things are getting more reported, but attempted rapes Increase, increase less than threefold during that same time. So attempted rapes, allegations of that did not increase nearly as much as allegations of completed rapes against children under the age of 15. Thank you, Gavina. Thank you, Professor. Um, it strikes me that um, if this were true and there was empirical evidence to back this up, this would be the strongest argument that the pro-smacking uh, lobby would have on a global stage to say this is the wrong course of action and we should continue to allow parents to discipline their children. You've had nine years since these statistics were published to evidence that corollary between those reported rapes in 2010 and the smacking ban. We're not talking about millions of people here. I mean, global warming is obviously a global issue. There are many facts. I don't, I don't suppose anyone around the room would disagree with mankind's responsibility for, for global warming, but that's not what we're here to talk about. It's a much bigger issue that it's harder to get um, a, an empirical evidence base uh, very swiftly from. But with this, if, if this is the strongest argument in the pro-smacking lobby's uh, arsenal, um, why has there not been the research to say, let's go and speak to the families of those people that were convicted of rape or accused of rape and ask about their parenting techniques? Why has that research not been undertaken? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's an important question. Uh, so this is, it's difficult to do research on parenting because uh, it's, you're more limited in being able to do the kind of randomized studies that would provide conclusive evidence. Uh, there is a little bit of that, but most of the research is correlational, which can't be as definite in terms of what is causing what. And that's the problem I've been trying to at least improve upon in my 30 plus years of research on parental, re parental discipline of various kinds. So we can't draw a direct causal link between the smacking ban and an increase of rapes in Sweden? Well, if I were a parent in Scotland and have, I had a baby girl this next year, I would want to be convinced that she would not be, uh, it'd be in the next, when she grew up, it would only be a 10 times greater risk of being raped before she's 15 years of age. So, so I would want an answer to that question to be convinced that, that that's not going to happen in Scotland. <clears throat> so I have two adolescent boys, or they're soon to be adolescent, two boys. Um, my wife and I have never yeah. hit them. Um, should we be anxious about their increased propensity to rape people? <laughs> no. Uh, you and I are from better backgrounds. We have all the advantages. So our children do too. So, so we need to make sure that the conclusions we come to aren't just imposing our parenting perspectives on everybody else that doesn't have the advantages that we have. Uh, my research shows that 
if children are well behaved or the, if their form of noncompliance is more negotiation, then yes, all kind of negative consequences, including time out as well as smacking, are adverse. That doesn't help them. So well-managed children don't need smacking. But, but parents, kids who push the limits, those are the ones where parents need something to back up the milder discipline tactics we all prefer when more defiant kids are pushing those limits and the milder things that we prefer aren't working for that particular child. Professor, it's the convener, Ruth McGuire. Um, your um, studies are, are cited by many people um, who are pro um, physical punishment of children. You've given a couple of quite emotive examples there of why you think um, children should be physically punished. How would you reflect on the fact that as lawmakers we need to follow evidence and not emotional arguments when making legislation? What would your response to that be? I absolutely agree with that. And the, uh, you know, particularly in these areas of family law, this is very important. Uh, and I, um, there's a group called the Association for Family and Conciliation Courts in the United States that has realized, particularly in family law, this is a big problem. They call the problem scholar advocacy bias. That if research is used primarily to support just one side and isn't tried, tried to be fair to all the evidence, then, then that's going to be detrimental to the, the um, forming and the application of family law. So it's important to avoid scholarly advocacy bias and try to be as objective as possible in considering all the evidence across all perspectives. Professor, can I um, ask then, for the record, before you began your work on this topic, were you neutral on the subject and it was the evidence that persuaded you or, or had you an opinion before you started? I, let's see, I, I had an opinion before I started. I thought that uh, since the vast majority of parents have smacked their children for many generations and the pendulum was swinging, that there were at least correlations, that smacking was correlated with various things, my general hypothesis to start with was that it's possible that, that the best use of smacking would be beneficial if used only in appropriate ways, only in appropriate conditions, but obviously smacking can be misused and overused. Okay. And so that makes it look detrimental. Okay. So, I, so I really was, my main goal was to distinguish what all scientists need to distinguish, what is the most effective form of any discipline tactic versus its ineffective and counterproductive ways and times of using them. Okay, but just, just to be I, very clear, before you began your research, you were pro-physical punishment of children. It's just a yes or no. a no. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm going no, to bring in pro, the rest of the committee I'm now. Pro research. Mm -hmm. I'll bring I in. was not. Let me let me read the conclusion of my first study. Here's uh, the conclusion of my first study on smacking, published in 1986. Professor, um, professor, result... professor, sorry, I, I'm going to stop you there. I'm, I, we've got quite limited time, so I'm going to invite questions from the rest of the committee, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to... We, we do have a copy of your study, so we, we have sight of it. No, Fulton McGregor, you had a supplementary question. Fulton McGregor, MSP, and Good afternoon, Professor. Um, I, I do really appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak to us today, although... I would have to say that um, I, I find some of your views expressed earlier quite um, uncomfortable. But what, what, what I wanted to ask about was um, Alex Cole, on Alex Cole Hamilton's point, he quoted um, something back to you when you said that, that perhaps the, the increase in the, the offences in, in juveniles in Sweden was related to um, young boys particularly been, not being told no by their mother. Do you uh, correlate being told no directly with physical punishment and violence? Now, could you repeat that again, sir? So it's about a parent boys not taking no for an answer from their mother and then yeah. not taking no from other people as well? Yes, so do you correlate... Did I just, what's the question? Sorry, it's, it's probably my accent, Professor. Do you correlate the not being told no by a mother or a father or another caregiver um, with um, being told no with, with physical violence? <clears throat> that... 
I'm not sure if this answers your question or not, but part of my, when I hear comments from people I know are opposed to smacking but are good researchers, then I take that into account. And I worked for people who were asked by the country of Norway to come and train all the therapists across Norway to help their parents manage their children's difficult behavior. And they said they were surprised to find so many parents coming to them with problem children that just couldn't say no to anything because they understood the smacking ban there to mean they couldn't use any negative consequences of any kind, so they couldn't say no to their children about the most reasonable things. So now that's from a top researcher in the field, good enough to be recruited by the country of Norway to train parents how to discipline their children when they couldn't use smacking. They were against, they've been against, personally against smacking all their lives, but they noted this problem in that country that too many people feel, too many parents, they can't use any negative consequences whatsoever. So I, I think... But I don't know if that answers... So, 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 sorry, Professor, I think if effective, effectively what I'm asking is, do you believe that the only effective way to say no to a young child is through physical oh. punishment? Because, but, but, that, but, that's, but, that's, but that's what your quote would seem to, to indicate. No, that's absolutely wrong. Like, like you and everyone, the goal is for parents to use the mildest discipline tactic and the mildest... Uh, reasonable interaction to resolve conflicts with their children. So the, the, first, I, the first plan is to use reasoning and to negotiate, find a mutually acceptable compromise to discipline problems. That should be the, the, the goal of all parents. And, but when that doesn't work, then that needs to be backed up by negative consequences, especially with the most oppositional defiant young children. Now, the, my, my research shows that reasoning works for preschoolers only if mothers back it up 10% of the time with, with some kind of negative consequences, preferably timeout and privilege removal. And if that works, that's all the further that has to go. And then the children learn, pay more attention to the reasoning. But it's those children who won't cooperate with even timeout, those are the ones for which the best research shows that smacking can be effective in enforcing cooperation with timeout, so the child will cooperate with this, so then timeout can be relied on to back up what a parent is trying to reason the child about. So that whole sequence is important, and psychologists use that sequence when they're asked by parents, help me manage my out of control child who qualifies for diagnoses called oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder. Then, then they train them to use timeout and the best backup for timeout according to their randomized studies is smacking and a brief room isolation. Those are the two most effective enforcements for timeout that have been documented. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, Mary Fee has a question. Thank you, um, convener, and good afternoon. Um, Professor, my name is Mary Fee, and I'm an MSP for West Scotland. You said in an earlier answer that you have based your views and opinions on research. There has been a significant amount of research that shows that children who are disciplined by use of physical force suffer negative outcomes, whether that's antisocial behaviour, mental health problems, and sometimes um, problems with um, substance abuse. Is that research you have looked at, and have you discounted that research as having no credibility? Well, I, my first study was like that that looked at correlations. And so my conclusion of my first study was this. Most of the results of this study support the view that moderate physical punishment provides a training ground for violence, a training ground that differs from child abuse only by degree. That was my conclusion of my first study. That disproves that I am biased in one direction or another. I'll read that again. Most of the results of this study support the view that moderate physical punishment provides a training ground for violence, a training ground that differs from child abuse only by degree. That was based on what are called 
cross-sectional correlations, concurrent correlations. But you can't tell what's leading to what. Is the, is the aggression causing the children to be smacked more, or is the smacking increasing aggression? So, uh, so I have done, since then, in contrast to others, I have replicated the strongest evidence against Professor, we're, no, Professor, we're having a little difficulty hearing you. I wonder if there's a piece of paper over the microphone at your end or something. We're having trouble oh, hearing, hearing you. you. Can you just make sure your microphone's clear? Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, Should I repeat good. anything? Or? Uh, you don't need to no, repeat it. No, no, it was just a bit crackly. So, um, now I've, I've repeated, since then I've repeated the strongest causal evidence against ordinary smacking. Uh, and... But in contrast to others, I have also used that same data to see how do other alternatives that parents could use instead, how do they look in those designs? And the results are the same for Ritalin, for non-physical punishment. So I, I replicate the strongest causal evidence against ordinary smacking, but non-physical consequences look just as harmful. And if parents get professional help, then having their child see a psychotherapist or putting on Ritalin, those look just as harmful as smacking in the, in the kind of research analyses that provide the strongest causal evidence against ordinary smacking. Hmm. Professor, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry um, to interrupt you. Um, the, the question I was, I was trying to get at was there is a significant sure. amount of research that has been done by respected academics into the effects that smacking a child can have. Did you look at that? I accept that you've done a huge amount of research yourself, but other pieces of research work that has been done by respected academics across the world, did you look at it and yep. discount it? Or did you take any of yes, it into I, account? I have done my very best to take all of it into account. So for example, now I've done the only review of the literature that focused on not just smacking, but other alternatives that parents could use instead. Published in 2005. And to do that, I took all of, I considered all the studies from Dr. Gershoff's first meta-analysis, as well as all the studies in my earlier analyses, other reviews of literature, so that I could fairly consider all of hers that qualified for that, uh, that meta-analysis in 2005. And it found that the, uh, the best way to use smacking was the way psychologists used to train parents to use it to, to enforce. So Thank I guess you. that wasn't quite Professor, sorry, I realise this is a little bit awkward because it's quite hard to keep having to because yeah. we can't we can't see you. It's easier if you're if you're in the building with us. Um, I think um, yeah. I'm going to bring back in Alex Cole Hamilton who had some questions for you. Thank, thank you, convener. Right. Actually, uh, Pro Professor Lars O'Leary, it's Alex Cole Hamilton again. Um, my uh, next round of questioning really follows on quite nicely from Mary Fees and, and your answer, your detailed answer there in terms of the efficacy of so-called backup smacking as a, a tool in the arsenal, if you like, of um, parenting, so that when normal uh, parenting techniques fail, defiance is continuous, then backup smacking can actually deliver that requirement. I just wonder, um, would... We, we recognise, though, that there are certain learning disabilities that children have which will not see developmental growth in the same way that children without those disabilities would have. They, they may not see the correlation between their behaviour and that physical punishment. They may never see that correlation and may continue to act yeah. defiantly. Would you support a partial ban on smacking for children with a diagnosed uh, learning difficulty? <clears throat> I think that's an important question, and I have not done research specifically on discipline of children with, with those kind of disabilities. So, um, but I guess I would want to be very careful about having a ban for them, because those kind of bans have prevented the use of some of the most effective uh, treatment programs in the past. But, and I'm thinking of Children who, children who abuse themselves, who just hit their heads against the wall until they're bleeding, that uh, in those cases, at least some people felt that some use of punishment 
uh, was effective at least for some of those. So, so I'd like. So, sorry, I'd Professor, can I just intervene there? Um, it sounds like you're conflating physical punishment with restraint. I don't think any sort of social care practitioner in this country certainly would use physical punishment uh, as a tool to stop somebody harming themselves. They would try to restrain them. I, I, am I right that you're conflating those two things? Well, it's, that's that's correct. That restraint would be a first option. But if they go back to doing it as soon as you can't restrain them, then that's not working. Okay. And some of the some of the very good research, at least researchers claimed, and I've seen that evidence, that at least in some cases, smacking could be used to n not for the. I don't know exactly how they used it. I'm not an expert. I haven't done this research myself. But smacking was part of the most effective treatment for children who have this habit of abusing themselves. Okay, um, thank you for that answer. Um, so obviously with some medical conditions, uh, learning difficulties in particular, um, whether that's acquired brain injuries or, or um, congenital defects, um, that children will grow into adults, yet their mental age will remain the same. Um, yes. Can you explain why we shouldn't liberalize the laws around physical punishment to allow us to use those uh, techniques that you describe when adults with learning difficulties are harming themselves or are being defiant or, or, or outwardly violent? Now, is the point of your question... So, so if, if, we, if we accept... No, he's asking me to repeat. Um, if we accept that some, um, some people in this society will grow from children to adulthood and their mental age will remain um, in, at three or four ne and never advancing beyond that because of their condition. Um, do you, is there a point at which we should, as a, as a society, if we accept your argument that physical punishment is, is a necessary tool of control for them, that there is a point at which they flip into adulthood and we can no longer hit them? Or should we be hitting adults with learning difficulties? Absolutely not. Again, this is, I do not specialize in research on parental discipline of people with uh, disabilities. Um, let's see, but, but, I, but this is an issue for not just, the, the research has shown that, another research has shown that smacking is only adverse if it's continued past, page, at past age 9 or 11. And uh, so, so I think the, the, the benefit of backup smacking is it, it causes children to cooperate with milder discipline tactics like timeout so that smacking doesn't have to be used in the future. So but, I do not think... But if I may, Professor, so I think, Professor you, you're citing research that says it stops being effective after kids are 9, 10, 11 years old, but that presupposes normal mental function. If we're talking about people who are three-year-olds in adult bodies, that doesn't apply to them, surely. Well, I, what I do know of that research with those kind of children and adults is that clear consequences are important, positive consequences, rewarding them, and having things like timeout or, or I worked in an organization that had what's called a token economy that had specific specific consequences to give privileges or take away privileges to uh, teach them to use more appropriate behavior. And those are very effective with children with development disabilities. That's not including smacking, though. Thank you. Uh, Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, Professor Gail Ross, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Um, th this bill just looks to give children equal protection with adults in the law, and we hope, if it passes, that it will actually affect cultural change as well. And a lot of the evidence that we have already taken from um, experts in their field say that it would provide a, a clarity in the law that isn't currently there at the moment. So if smacking is used, as, as you would advocate, as um, a backup a form of punishment, but you also mentioned misuse and overuse, and there could also be the chance that it's used as the main form of punishment, which also wouldn't be your stated aim. In the privacy of the home, how do we know that this is being adhered to? We well, don't, but it's better to help parents to know how to use all their discipline tactics as effectively as possible, rather than having blanket uh, proscriptions of 
of discipline tactics that have been used by most parents for many generations. Now let's, I think there was another part of your question that I've forgotten, so Did, what, have I not, what have I not answered? The, the, the oh, people, that correct. The sorry, the people that correct. say that they're looking for clarity and if, if it's used as a form of backup punishment, I don't think um, they would say that that's giving any clarity. Well, it was clear enough that, that psychologists used to train parents of out-of-control children to use that kind of smacking to back up time out. So those defiant children would walk away with time out. So it's, uh, there was very clear to them, they prescribed and modeled two swats of an open hand to the rear end when children wouldn't cooperate with the time out chair and used only in that situation when those defiant children would not cooperate with time out. They showed that when that happened consistently, then the children learned to cooperate with timeout, so the parent didn't need to use smacking anymore. Uh, again, that to me, that's a very clear prescription, and uh, so so I think we need to discriminate between more less effective ways to use all discipline tactics. Can you describe, for the record? Um, if psychologists are um, uh, advocating this as a, a form of being able to control unruly children, what does smacking in that form look like? Is it back of the hand, back of the legs, one smack, two more? What, what's the, what's the, the recommended amount of smacking? Well, when psychologists trained parents to do that, then they, the, one I, the best reacher I know used two hard slaps of an open hand to the rear end when children, only when children wouldn't cooperate with timeout because they wanted a amount of discipline actually like timeout to be effective so they never had to use smacking. But um, a study just came out this week. Of course, people don't use the smacking back up anymore and they don't use the only alternative that's been shown to be as effective very often, which is a brief room isolation. But a study I just got from a Harvard professor this week says that now those treatments are half as effective as they were back when they used the smack back up for timeout. Dr. John Weiss and his colleagues from Harvard University published this week. It's uh, Professor Ruth McGuire, um, convener. Can I just ask which um, professional psychological association advocates for two hard, open-handed strikes on the rear end of a child? Well, this is the problem of scholar advocacy bias, that advocates want professional organizations to side with them. And oh, so sorry, right pro sorry, Professor, uh, I'm going I'm to pause you there. In your evidence to the committee there, you said that psychologists working with um, families to teach this method advocate two, and your words were hard, open-handed strikes on the rear end of a child. Which professional association are these psychologists a member of? There are no professional organizations that recommend that today. And okay, for that reason, thank you. Thank I you. Think That's fine. For that thank reason, you. treatment is half as effective as it was back when smacking was used. Thank you. A I Harvard hear you study answer. that came out this week. Okay, are you done? Okay, we have a, an additional question from uh, the member proposing the bill, John Finney. Uh, good afternoon, Professor, and, and thanks very much for joining us. It's, it's been a very interesting evidence session. Um, I wonder with regard to the extensive research you've done and the conclusions you've reached, um, if you're able to advise the committee when the optimum time is to start, commence, striking a child hard with the open hand on the rear end. What, what, what age frame? The research that shows that, that smacking is an effective enforcement for time out came, is, was done on children between the ages of two and six. So that's where I can speak most confidently. Uh, so I'm not sure how far to extend it beyond that. Uh, I think two to 12 that uh, the limits that Canada came up with is a reasonable one. Although, in this country, most mothers are smacking their children by 18 months. So in the lack of research, I would support mothers, the majority of mothers, rather than banning that until we have more evidence about how far to go beyond the ages of two to six. Certainly, it should not be done 
for any children under the age of twelve months i clearly think that that should be banned that smacking should not be used of any kind for a child under the age of twelve months twelve months to eighteen months certainly a hard two hard smacks with the open hand in the rear end is appropriate well one pediatrician talked about a child who got a habit of biting electrical cords plugged into a socket and apparently this the parents couldn't get her to stop that and so the pediatrician was saying shouldn't that child be smacked to prevent her from harming herself by biting an electrical wire plugged into socket so, so that's one reason i don't want it to be completely criminalized but it should be discouraged i think up to the age of two years 24 months yeah, well, for the avoidance of doubt, we would seek to discourage anyone from biting electrical cables at any age. But I, I, I wonder if you can clarify whether in the course of your research you saw any benefits in the use of an implement, for instance, in disciplining a, an 18-month to 18 month to two-year-old. Well, the only, in my summary of all the research I could find that examined not just smacking but alternatives, Physical punishment led to worse outcomes only if it was used too severely or as the primary means of discipline. And severely meant studies that were using implements. So there's, so there's no evidence to support the use of implements to, to you to smack a child. Now I would, I guess I would prefer, there are some parents I know that see some advantage to that. So personally, I would be more comfortable with saying that parents can use an implement as long as it's not capable of inflicting more harm than the open hand, like a newspaper, you know, for example, a rolled up newspaper. Okay, th thanks for providing that clarity, uh, Professor. Thank you. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you, Professor. I, I recognise the challenges in doing this type of yes. um, Q&A down the line. I appreciate your time and the evidence that you've given. Um, our next meeting will be on the 28th of March where we will take further evidence on the bill and now close the meeting.